I have three things that I want to talk about. And to a significant degree, they actually overlap with what Peter's been saying, although the terminology I'm going to use is so different. It may not be obvious to me, to you, that I'm saying some of the same things as him. Um, <clears throat> the issues I want to talk about are the importance, the economic value of natural capital. And by natural capital, I mean mineral resources and living ecosystems, and the returns that economic systems gain from possessing natural capital. Then I want to talk about the shortcomings of gross domestic product as a measure of economic performance, something I think everybody is familiar with to some degree, but I want specifically to relate the shortcomings of GDP uh, to its failure to capture the value of natural capital, the services provided by natural capital, and then the rampant depletion of natural capital which is going on around us. And then finally, I want to talk about sustainability and how to tie these two issues, previous issues together in a discussion of sustainability in terms of natural capital. Now, I like to start talks on this topic with this quote, believe it or not, from a Republican president of the United States. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt, who was pub president back at the turn of the last century, said in 1907, and this is 105 years ago now, guys, uh, he said, the nation behaves well if it treats the natural resources as assets which it must turn over to the next generation, increased and not impaired in value. That's actually quite a remarkable statement for a Republican 105 years ago. He's really saying two important things there. He's saying that natural resources are assets, and assets, of course, are things that give a, give a, give a flow of returns to us. They have value. Um, so in some sense, he's previewing this whole concept of natural capital that I'll be talking about. And then secondly, <clears throat> by that reference to turning over these assets unimpaired in value to the next generation, he's talking about concepts of stewardship and sustainability, uh, which have emerged in the last decade or so. So 105 years ago, a Republican president, believe it or not, was actually saying things really quite prescient uh, in terms of the way we think about issues today. Uh, there's obviously been something of a, of a backwards movement uh, in his successes, unfortunately. Um, we are, I think, witnessing the emergence of a new paradigm, and this is something that Peter said, and, and I'm basically going to be saying the same thing, but in a somewhat different language here. Um, the new paradigm is one in which we think about a society's total capital stocks, and we think about the, the portfolio of capital stocks that a society has, and we think about economic development as management of that portfolio of capital stocks and changes in the composition of that portfolio of capital stocks. So by a portfolio of capital stocks, I mean obviously physical capital, built capital, things like this building and the structures in here and around here. I mean human capital, the sort of skills and knowledge of our, uh, of our populations. Intellectual capital, which is all of the systems that we can understand and the what knowledge we have about how to make things work and improve life. And then finally, natural capital. Um, <clears throat> And all of these are assets that yield a return. All of these are assets in which we can make an investment. Um, now, what do we mean by natural capital? As I mentioned before, really, the natural capital is a combination of things. It's mineral resources, obviously, oil, gas, coal, etc. Uh, that's, that's the easy and rather obvious part of natural capital. But it's also living systems. I mean, systems like rivers and, ra rivers and lakes, uh, which generate hydropower, which provide drinking water, which are obviously essential to the economy. Uh, but then also things like watersheds, soils, forests, fisheries. Uh, these are all living ecosystems. They're part of natural capital, and they provide really important services to human societies. Um, and what's happening here is that two different concepts are coming together. There's the economist concept of natural capital, and then there's a concept from ecology and from biology of ecosystem services. You know, biologists have claimed for a long time that the natural environment is not just beautiful and, and thrilling and, and, and valuable in, a, in an aesthetic sense, but it's actually important in a real down-to-earth sense of providing essential services to human societies. And they classify these services as ecosystem services. And they classify them into some of the categories I've got in this slide here. You know, climate stabilization, pollination, which is obviously critical in producing food supplies, other aspects of food production from the soil, waste decomposition, recreation, and so on. These are all of the various services provided to us by natural capital. And uh, these services can be seen, these ecosystem services, which biologists write about, can be seen in economic terms as the return that we as a society earn on our natural capital. So natural capital is earning a rate of return for us, and that rate of return 
uh, is measured in terms of this flow of ecosystem services. These are sometimes hard services to put a dollar value on, but that doesn't mean they don't have a dollar value. I mean, they have a very, a very significant dollar value in many cases. It's just not one that's captured in, in a marketplace. Um, so the, um, I think that's, that's the, the paradigm which is emerging and the paradigm to which Peter was referring, the new paradigm to which Peter is referring. It's, it's a merging of concepts from economics, in particular from capital theory, and concepts from ecology and biology, and these concepts of ecosystem services there. Now, for example, uh, to take a topical issue, the stable climate, the stability of the climate system is a return on natural capital. You know, the, the climate system is kept stable by a range of very complicated interacting ecosystems, you know, terrestrial ecosystems, marine ecosystems, and so on. Uh, and so the stability of the climate, the habitability of the climate, is a return that we get on the conservation of those ecosystems. And if we destroy those ecosystems, we're depleting a form of natural capital, and the, the return that we lose there is the stability of the climate, which, as everybody's increasingly aware, has a real economic cost. So that's a comment on my first topic, which is natural capital. Uh, next thing I want to do, as I said, is to switch brief and talk very briefly about uh, gross domestic product and some of the shortcomings of gross domestic product and tie them into this. Um, so the um, shortcomings of gross domestic product really stem, as I said before, from its failure to capture the value of natural capital and the services that that provides. And I think that the easiest way to, to, to to persuade you of this point is just to give you a very simple example. I've actually got a couple of examples, but I'll skip the second one. So um, here's the example. In the northwest of India, the Punjab, which is the, sort of the bread basket of India, uh, most farmers irrigate their land for a large part of the year uh, by drawing up subsoil water. So they have aquifers underground, and they draw up water from these aquifers to irrigate their land. Now, for the last decade, roughly speaking, the water table in these subsoil aquifers has been falling at about three meters per year, three meters a year. So three meters is somewhere right up here. That's a lot of fall every year. So over a decade, it's fallen by about 30 meters. Uh, because, the, uh, because the water table is falling so rapidly, farmers are having increasingly to invest a great deal more effort and capital equipment in extracting water to irrigate their, their, uh, their farms. Uh, so they're buying pumps, uh, they're buying fuel for the pumps, they're buying electricity for the pumps, they're using labor uh, to draw up more water. And all of this appears to be increasing gross domestic product because they're investing and increasing investment raises gross domestic product and increasing investment in pumps and pumping equipment, increasing employment of labor. All of this raises gross domestic product. So if you look at what's happening from the perspective of gross domestic product, it says things are going well. The depletion of the subsoil water is not a problem. It's actually a source of economic growth, source of economic activity. But when you think of it from a long-term perspective, that's obviously ridiculous. What we've got here is a crisis just waiting to happen. Uh, and once the, the level of subsoil water falls below a certain level, and the, the, the subsoil water is significantly depleted, the productivity of a major agricultural region in, in Asia is going to drop very sharply, with huge implications for food supplies. So um, the you know, gross domestic product is focusing on some flows. It's not focusing on the stocks. And what's really happening here is we're depleting a stock. We're depleting a stock of natural capital, uh, which is the subsoil water. Um, so um, I've got another example here, but I can skip that. I think it makes very much the same sort of point. Um, so we need a different measure of economic performance if we're going to grapple with these issues in a persuasive way. We need a more sustainability-oriented measure of economic performance. And I'll talk exactly about what sustainability is in a second. Um, there's a number of alternatives. In fact, this is really a growth industry, actually. I mean, there must have been uh, 20 or 30 alternative measures of economic performance persuaded uh, p p p profit in the last couple of last, last decade, I'd say. Um, uh, one, for example, would be to move, a very simple thing would be to move from gross domestic product to net domestic product. Uh, gross domestic product is just the total value of all goods and services produced in the economy. Net domestic product is just that total value net of the depletion of capital. Now, when we look in the normal national income accounts for depletion of capital, what we find is the depreciation of physical capital, depreciation of buildings like this and desks like this one here and PCs and stuff like that. And that's actually usually for various reasons a fairly meaningless number. Um, but if we were to look, if we were to include, if we were to subtract from gross domestic product the depreciation of all forms of capital, including natural capital, we actually would capture some of these issues I'm concerned about. And there have been a number of attempts to do that and they produce a number which is often referred to as green national income. 
and you can find discussion of that in the background paper I've written on this. Another uh, measure which people have invented and which uh, actually has got quite a lot of press and quite a lot of usage in the last couple of decades is the United Nations Development Program's Human Development Index, or HDI, which is an attempt to move away from a strictly economic-based measure of economic performance. Uh, so the HDI takes into account not just income levels, but also life expectancy, measures of health, and also measures of education. So the HDI for a country is a kind of an average of income levels, of life expectancy at birth, and of average years of education. Um, and finally, the last thing I want to mention and I want to focus on most is a number called the adjusted net savings, which is produced by the World Bank. Uh, ANS or adjusted net savings, which I think is actually a very good starting point for talking about the measurement of natural capital and the measurement of sustainability. What I've got in the next three slides is just some quick data which shows you the differences between these things. This is simply a measure, this is simply showing you gross domestic product for six countries. Uh, going from 1980 to 2010, the data points on the horizontal scale are not uniform. Uh, 1980, 1990, 2000, and then 2005 to 2010 annually. Okay, so that looks slightly strange. Uh, the top line there is, uh, is GDP for the US. The next line down is Germany. Uh, the next line down is Botswana. Next line down beneath that is China. Then at the bottom you've got India and Papua New Guinea. So you've basically got two rich countries, two middle income countries, and two poor countries. And I've drawn those countries because they happen to be countries I was using for some other part of a research project. Uh, and um, they all show an upward trend over time, uh, except for a slight dip around about 2008, 2009. Um, this is the Human Development Index for the same set of countries over exactly the same time period. Top is the US, second is Germany, then we've got uh, China and Botswana bracketed very closely together, and then India and Papua New Guinea. Um, very much the same time trend, you know, upward trend, very much the same. The same countries at the top, the same countries at the bottom. The difference is that the gaps between, gap between uh, the US and Germany is much, much less, and the gap between Botswana and China is much, much less. So the, the scaling is somewhat different, but qualitatively it looks much the same. Now here's adjusted net savings, which is basically the change in the total value of capital stocks, including natural capital, including human capital. Um, the top line there is Botswana. The second line there is China. Uh, Germany and the US are down towards the bottom. So if you look at things in terms of the way in which they're building up their capital stock, or they're maintaining their total capital stock intact, including natural capital, uh, then the most successful countries actually are Botswana uh, and China. And the two richest countries, the uh, Germany and the US, are actually right down towards the bottom, which is interesting and emphasizes the point that being rich and being sustainable by no means the same thing. So let me talk about sustainability. Um, whoops, sorry, I've gone too far there. Um, sustainability can be defined as keeping the total capital stock of a country intact. Uh, so keeping it the, the, the value of the total capital stock of a country intact. So sustainability in this definition is keeping the total value of physical capital human capital, intellectual capital, and natural capital intact. You're sustainable if that value stays constant or is increasing. You're not sustainable if that value decreases. What's the motivation for that particular definition? It's a couple of motivations. The principal one is that economists think of income as the return on capital. Uh, now, there's a very good definition of income that John Hicks gave back in the 1930s. He said income is the maximum amount you can spend this month consistent with spending the same amount in all subsequent months. If you think about that, that's a really subtle definition of income. Uh, it's income is basically it's income as sustainable income. Um, and if you think about that definition a little bit further, it tells you that income is basically interest on wealth, where wealth is very broadly defined. Just as a throwaway remark, that definition of income would suggest that Saudi Arabia's uh, that the money that Saudi Arabia gets from selling oil, for example, does not classify, is not, would not be classified as income. Right, for obvious reasons. We'll come back to that if it's not obvious later on. Um, so uh, if you can maintain your capital stock intact, and if income is interest on capital, then you're maintaining your income level intact. So that's, that's the motivation for thinking about sustainability in terms of maintaining capital stock intact. 
Now, let me give you a slightly different perspective on this. Um, the process of economic development can be thought of as, as I mentioned at the beginning, as changing the composition of a country's portfolio of capital stocks. Let me take a concrete example. Think about the United Kingdom prior to the Industrial Revolution. Okay, prior to the Industrial Revolution, the United Kingdom had vast reserves of natural capital. It was a very, very heavily forested country, for example. Uh, during the Industrial Revolution, uh, you know, the steam engine was invented. Uh, steam engine initially burnt wood. So during the Industrial Revolution, what we saw was the destruction of most of the United Kingdom's natural capital. Uh, it was the, the, by the end of the Industrial Revolution, the United Kingdom was almost entirely deforested. None of the original forest cover was left. Uh, but so the natural capital had been run down quite aggressively. But at the same time, we built up huge amounts of physical capital, roads, railways, canals, bridges, other forms of infrastructure, steam engines, and so on. And we built up a lot of intellectual capital the knowledge of how to make all of the aforementioned and make them work, the knowledge of how to run things in factories and so on. So the process of industrialization there was the depletion of natural capital, the destruction of natural capital, but its replacement by physical and intellectual capital. And obviously that occurred on terms which allowed living standards to rise. Because by the end of the Industrial Revolution, it's un unambiguously clear that most people in the UK were better off than they were beforehand. And if you think about you know, economic development in the world as a whole since then, it's been the same pattern. It's been the destruction of natural capital, um, the destruction of forests, the depletion of fisheries, the extinction of species. Uh, but at the same time, it's been a massive buildup of physical capital, uh, the construction of infrastructure, and a massive buildup of intellectual capital. You know, we've got antibiotics, we've got computers, we've got the internet, we've got cell phones and cellular communications and so on. There's a, obviously huge life-changing intellectual developments uh, that have occurred in the last half century or so. So we've depleted our natural capital, uh, but we have built up physical capital, we've built up intellectual capital, and we've raised our living standards in doing so. And again, I think you know, it's, while a lot of people might regret the depletion of the natural capital, it's unambiguous that our living standards have raised through this process of substituting physical and intellectual capital for natural capital. Now the big question that we face at the moment really big question, and this is really central to the whole environmental debate, is can we continue to do this? Or how much further can we continue to do this? Can we continue to run down natural capital, but compensate for this and still increase our living standards by building up the amounts of physical and intellectual capital we have? Can we replace species and forests by bridges and tunnels and new devices of one sort or another uh, and still maintain our living standards? Um, Increasingly, scientists are suggesting the answer to this question is no. Uh, in economic terms, early on it was easy to substitute physical and intellectual capital for natural capital. The elasticity of substitution between these things uh, was, was high. Uh, but as you run down your natural capital, what's happening basically is it becomes harder and harder to replace natural capital adequately by physical and intellectual capital. In economic terms, the elasticity of substitution is getting to be much, much smaller and requires much, much more in the way of physical intellectual capital to replace and compensate for a given loss of, of, human, of, of natural capital. Um, so specifically, for example, scientists are suggesting that we can't replace a stable climate by more physical or intellectual capital, that a stable climate is something which is absolutely essential to us. Uh, it's essential to food production. It's essential to a lot of other aspects of our lifestyle and that uh, it will be impossible to compensate for add a significant climate change just by building up more physical capital or more intellectual capital, which would be the, the business as usual pathway. Uh, that we can't, for example, replace the, the photosynthetic organisms that create the oxygen that we breathe uh, by physical or intellectual capital. That I think is a, is a rather a no-brainer. Uh, that we can't, produce, we can't replace soil as a medium for producing food uh, by uh, building up greater, greater stocks of physical or intellectual capital. So this suggests that, that you know, at the point where we're reaching now, uh, the maintaining total capital intact may not be adequate as a way of sustaining our living standards. Uh, that we may actually be more important to focus in on natural capital and to maintain some aspects of natural capital intact rather than just maintaining the total value of capital stocks intact. There's a difference here between what uh, people in the literature call weak and strong sustainability. 
Weak sustainability in literature is referred to as just maintaining the total value of capital stocks of all types intact, and that allows you to substitute physical and intellectual capital for natural capital, where a strong sustainability is maintaining the, the total value of living natural capital intact, maintaining ecosystems and so on intact. Um, I think it's, it's an open question uh, which of these is, is the right model. My own preference is towards the second. I think that um, I find myself finding convincing that the, um, that the process of substituting natural capital uh, by physical and intellectual capital is one which is reaching the end of the road. Um, and the, uh, the measure that I was showing you in the previous slide um, of adjusted net savings is actually a, a good measure in many ways of trying to understand what's happening to the economy's total capital stock uh, and whether we're changing the composition of that in a way which is potentially detrimental to our ability to maintain our living standards. Thank you. Thank you very much.